But imagine those farmers, every time they take their beloved animals that have lived with them for seven or eight years to slaughter, what, don't any of them ever look back and think, those cows look back and think, what are you doing to me, man? What are you doing to me? Where am I going? I can hear all that in there. You, you can argue all you want that people have had all of these... Um, indoctrinations but actually you people know what's right and wrong and to see those individual animals that you know when they see the farmer going up the field the, those cows bellow out to them because it, for whatever reason mm. you know and they must have a relationship but they're just um, unfortunately mm. they're just hard they're mm. just cold <laughs> Okay, so here we are, another episode of the Carb Strong Cast, and I'm here with a good friend of mine, Billy, from the Retreat Animal Rescue, up here in Kent, Ashford? Ash Ashford. Ashford, Kent. Yeah. So, Billy, I'm excited to have this podcast with you, because you've been uh, vegan for a long time now. How long have you been vegan for? Um, come out 32 years now. 32 years. So, yeah. the same amount of time I've been on the earth, oh, you've been boy. a vegan. Yeah. Oh, bless. <laughs> yeah. But that's Amazing. crazy. So a lot of the people listening might not know who you are. So you could just give a brief overview of what you do, um, and then we'll get into how you got into that. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm founder of the Retreat Animal Rescue, mm -hmm. which is a farmed animal sanctuary, but also a sanctuary for horses, domestic animals, and British wildlife. So that's kind of... I'm at the helm of that. Oh, wow. And... Like it seems very simple, but there's a lot that goes on here. But how did you how did you find yourself, um, you know, involved with sanctuaries? Well, so from a very very young age, you know, they always loved animals, and that kind of then that grows into justice. Yeah, basically, you want justice. So from the age of fourteen, really vegetarian, um, not vegan, vegetarian. Why? Why did you go <coughs> vegetarian? Because you cared about animals. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I saw in a cookery lesson at school, they brought in some dead pheasants and some dead rabbits. And I had rabbits and chickens at home. So, oh, wow. So that was it. When I saw that's what you're going to make the food out of. Instant vegetarian. Yeah. So you that, didn't just not eat pheasants and rabbits. You just didn't eat any animals after that. No animals, no animals. And of course, you go home, you've got your guinea pigs and your rabbits. And you think, wow, this is like, that's the same little creatures. So that was it. And then I started dog walking at sanctuaries, cleaning out at sanctuaries or rescue centers, as they were called then. Yep. And then it just grew, really. So, yeah, and the justice part of it grew. You know, you just want justice for animals. And mm -hmm. you think, well, actually, I don't want to be part of this. So, yeah, that's what happened. When did you recognize the full scope or come to awareness of the full scope of what we're doing to animals? So really, when I was 19, for my shame, I was told about veganism. Yeah. I was explained and actually I didn't believe it. I thought this cannot be true. There wasn't the internet then. So I had to go to the library, yeah. get, get books. And basically the books were all written by the mil um, milk and dairy industry and yeah. the meat industry. So basically they painted a really wonderful picture of it all. So it took me a year, which is terrible, isn't it? So when I was 20, I got the opportunity to go to a farm and uh, that's it. The, the truth is there. Once you see it with your own eyes, there's no going back. You know, that's it. So so you say an opportunity to go to a farm, you were invited onto the farm or you just went and had a look or? Uh, actually, I was offered a cow. So I was uh, so already saving animals. So I was offered a cow and I thought, well, I love cows. You know, I'm happily drinking milk and eating the cheese and whatever. So I went and saw it. And although in the UK, veal crates had been outlawed, mm -hmm. I, I assumed when you outlaw someone, you dismantle it and it all goes. But they were still using... Um, veal crates uh, but called them the nursery so once I saw all the babies in the nursery I was mortified I thought this cannot be true so I came home with three calves so yeah wait is That's... this the first animals that you've ever taken out of or, or ever rescued or uh, no so it wasn't the first because but it was the it was the first rescue of 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 calves really okay. and that's what set set me on my vegan journey yeah because of the dairy industry and obviously yeah, yeah. a lot of people don't see that they turn vegetarian for ethics because it's quite obviously a chopped up animal's body and they don't realize about the under, other industries now we've got social media that the, the amazing so that information just spreads like wildfire now yeah so at the start you were probably like surprised at a lot of what happens in the industry and what did that turn into that surprise or that anger well, I think when you're told things, so the, I remember the farmer's wife telling me, 
oh, don't worry, the mums are used to it now, which now we accept is something called cancellation of hope. You know, we yeah. know that these animals suffer from cancellation of hope. But when I was told it, you know, they, they accept it. No, they don't accept it. That's absolutely, they, they can't do anything about it. You know, mm. acceptance is something that maybe we can still do something about, but they couldn't. So that was it for me. Yeah. yeah. No more milk. Well, it's crazy to me that they use euphemisms like nursery for something that's obviously not a nursery. Oh, yeah. There was a better one that she said. I'll never forget this. I said, when I saw these lines of babies I, and they have water and like rabbit mix, so there's no milk, there's water and, and this cereal. I said to the, the farmer's wife, this, the woman, well, how do you make these calves, these newborns, drink water and eat milk um, and eat cereal because this is completely against what they should. And she actually replied, a welly on the head. So basically she'd walk along with her welly, pushing their little heads into the buckets. And uh, yeah, this is how much she cared about them, wow. a welly on the head. Wow, so she'd stomp their heads into the food to, to, to force them to do something that is not yeah. natural for them. So they're obviously wanting to feed off their mother. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So they're waiting for the milk, but there's no milk coming. You know, you're four days old or whatever. You mm. get a welly on the head to drink the water. Because we're on the topic of dairy, um, veal crates were obviously for the veal industry and veal isn't, it's, well, it's been outlawed here. The, 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 no. It's not consumed here as much. No, it hasn't been outlawed here. We we stopped um, veal crates in the 80s, yeah. but when people still eat veal. We just we just group house them now. Yeah. So, you know, and they're, so it's meant to be <laughs> a, okay. a nicer thing. They're in the play pens now, not yeah. the nursery. Because uh, seeing dairy farms, they're all in those uh, hutches. Uh, yeah. They're the female calves. They're the ones that are, they're growing for to be used in the dairy. Well, basically... Um, you only replace a third of the herd every year. So females won't, not every female will go to be a milker. She'll be veal as well, you wow. know. So we've got a lovely female dairy cow here. Um, yeah, female dairy calf. She's a yearling now. She would have been veal. So, yeah. So it's just the veal crates that were outlawed, not the practice of killing babies for for meat. Absolutely. No, yeah. Un unbelievable, really, mm. when you think about it, mm. that you think, right, something's been stopped, so they would be dismantled. But, oh, no, they're just used. They're just called something else. Mm. They find any way they can to make money off these animals, whether they're babies or whether they're fully grown or just everything, their skin. and Yeah, absolutely. In mm. fact, the first cow that came to live at the, um, the retreat, she was just 12 pounds in money. And she was 10 days old and the woman was buying her to make mittens. So not even meat. She was going to use her skin to make mittens. So that's all her life would have, you know, that's all it amounted Reduced to. to. Wow. Yeah. 12 pounds for, yeah. a, for someone's life. Yeah. It's crazy how we put a price on these animals. And uh, absolutely. And can you yeah. imagine being that young in a ring? How alien it must be at a livestock market. Mm. You're a baby. There's no parent, no, nothing else. You're yeah. just, there you are. Just terrible. Yeah, up into um, live sale of animals, and it just it, to me it just rings of the slave trade. I mean, the, the terrified animals torn from their mothers, you know, humans all around them scared, and they're being sold off. You know, for me, I, I don't see any difference to that. I mean, uh, it's crazy we treat them just purely as products and objects, basically. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And I suppose here in the UK, people are mortified when you see dog and cats in cages going to be enter the food chain. Yeah. What difference is that to a lobster, a chicken, a trout, a salmon, mm. you know, a cow, a pig? What What difference is it? You know, yeah. they all want to live. So, yeah. It's just our perception of those animals and absolutely. the value we give to them, not the value that's intrinsic inside of these animals. Yeah, we, without mm. a doubt. Yeah, we devalue them or we give them value depending on species or, you know, the cultural sort of level we're at with the way we view animals at the time and whatever country you're in, it differs, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So with the retreat, you founded it back in the 80s or 89 was it yeah absolutely so 30 years ago really so that was that was that was the start of it all so it was just on a rented bit of land you know helping what you can taking in what you can yeah. and it's grown from there really wow. so, yeah. and how many animals do you house now so we just did our count for the week and we've got about 1100 wow. at the moment yeah so amazing that's everything so that's from every pigeon that lives here to every fish, to every turtle, turkey, chicken, cockerel, sheep, cat, dog, whatever. Yeah. Wow. 
Sounds like a lot of animals to care for, quite overwhelming. You got a team behind you though? I've got an amazing team. Yeah, this isn't all down to one person. This no. isn't all down to me. This is this is down to uh, the people behind it. Yeah. And that's not just the people that look after the animals. That's the people that give, that bring animal food and newspaper mm. and bedding. So yeah, wow. it's an amazing so, team. Yeah, it's great. It's great here. It's a beautiful place here. I love it here at the retreat. And um, I want to get into... Like, obviously, well, 30 years is a long time and you would have seen a lot of animals come and go. You would have seen a lot of suffering that animals endure. And, you know, a lot of animals, you know, <laughs> seeking sanctuary from this industry that exploits and kills them. You would have lost a lot of animals along the way. Can you talk about some of your struggles with, you know, running a sanctuary this size? And Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I think really the, um, you're, you're based, you know, every day there are those those same struggles. But yeah. I think what what we see is the different in trends of animals. So mm. 30 years ago to maybe 10 years ago, almost every pig that would come would be a pig that survived the meat industry. Now you're up against it with the pig, the pet pig trade. So oh, wow. you're, you're getting dumped pigs that are pet pigs all the time. So actually they're actually stealing the places of the meat pigs, you know, so yeah. where once you would have a hundred percent meat pigs that were saved, you're now mopping up after the pet industry. So that's like another challenge now. So what do people think that they're buying a mini pig and they grow up or what's going on here? Yeah, without a doubt, they think they're going to buy. I actually had a woman who once said, I bought this pig and I was told it would stay the size of a guinea pig. Well, you know, guinea pig is like a bag of sugar, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, no, this pig's going to be like 150 kilos. And so. it's almost once they get to six months, that's when they start really packing a on the size. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. And these people have bought these things thinking, you know, because there's no regulation. I mean, it's actually in the UK, it's actually illegal to own a single pig. But I can tell you the amount of people that buy single pigs and hand them into the... You know, no one's policing it. Not no. just so the breeder's just happy to sell you whatever. So terrible. Mm. So, and like obviously the industry, they manipulate the genetics of these animals, and they're they're feeding them these growth like antibiotics to you know to stimulate growth in these animals, and they're coming up against you know just disease and things that they like that that, that the industry have sort of left them with. Yeah, absolutely. So. For instance, if we look at pigs, if pigs from the meat industry arrive here, I think their slaughter weight are about seven months old. So you've you've kind of got this ginormous animal that you're going to have to deal with. And actually, if you carried on feeding it like that, you're going to have a dead pig at 10, you know, yeah. where now our pigs live to 15, 18 years old. Wow. So, yeah, because we control that kind of intake of those high calorie foods. Yeah. And what about birds like chickens and I think chickens, because what are they lasting now, like in the, the meat industry, like 40 days or something like that? Yeah. So that's the, I think they're commonly known as broiler chickens, Broilers, aren't yeah. they? And that's terrible because they're the kindest, kindest creatures you know i mean they they arrive here with all sorts of mm. problems and uh, there's very little we can do for them you know we just make their life happy for that short time might have them for a year a year and a half but not much more than that it's yeah terrible. their little hearts and their little bodies just uh their, their bodies grow so quickly and they just can't support their weight and yeah it's their frame you know their, mm. that frame can't support everything that's going on so quickly as mm. well and the other thing is all these um industrial bred animals they're all laced with antibiotics so yeah. you bring them to a sanctuary where it's all happy and outside and actually they're up against it because they no longer get all the antibiotics so anything that the wild birds fly in with that's why you see these epic outbreaks of um what's it called avian flu yeah. swine fever yeah. um, this is what happens isn't it it's terrible yeah um it's almost like that you they're rescued out of that suffering and then they have these other battles to deal with afterwards that yeah. you know, the industry leave them with too. It's almost like they're never truly free from what the industry does to them. Oh, you're absolutely right. Mm. Yeah, they, they will live with that till the day they die. You yeah. know, it's, it's so terrible. So you offer them the best life that you can and, you know, there's times we have to let go of animals and any animal that has left a mark on you that you sort of always remember or there's just too many there's no or they uh, i think that there's always going to be those iconic ones yeah. those ones that are under your skin i mean yeah. recently we we lost a duck and you know there is there's probably what six billion people on the earth who think oh, it's just a duck you yeah. know but actually uh, the duck was called mr darcy and we'd had him a long time and he had been um he he was taken out of um 
a duck farm that actually went bust. It was it was in the newspaper. Okay. He was one of I think we had three and a half thousand or something come from there. He was such a character. Everyone loved him. I mean, he was the most amazing thing. But it came to that day, you know, where absolutely you have to do the best thing because for a lot of people they don't understand that because we call ourselves a no kill shelter that doesn't mean we don't put animals to sleep at their end of their lives when yeah. they need to be put to sleep of so course. we don't ignore that you know when that time comes we yeah. absolutely put them to sleep and his time came recently and so heartbreaking as you know it, it will always be heartbreaking mm. so. so let's just talk about that because um a lot of people might not understand that but if you put like a human being in that situation where they're suffering and there's not much more you can do for them of course the, the most humane thing to do in that case would do would would be in, in the animal's interest to take them out of that suffering and let them go. Yeah. You know, uh, so there's a distinction there between robbing someone of their life that's completely fine and wants to live or exploiting them, putting them through this suffering and then robbing them of their life to, to eat their body or, or whatever. Some, yeah. yeah. It's like if your dog is sick, you know, you're going to put them down. If they, there's nothing more the vet can do. And yeah. Yeah. And I think with the bigger mammals, like the cattle, mm. their time comes when they've when they're older and they've grown weak and they can't get up and yeah. you know because for those large animals they can't sustain lying down for long periods yeah. of time it's not good for them so you kind of know when that time comes but it'll never be easy and actually it's probably a little bit harder than putting your dog to sleep because in the UK people love dogs and, mm. and cherish them but we don't with cows so yeah. those cows we have put to sleep here represent the horrors that are going on in the industry you know so yeah yeah they really do like I always have this bit of sweet feeling when I'm here like these animals are the lucky ones but it makes you think of all the animals oh, yeah. that are unlucky and they're they're just too many to comprehend like yeah the, the sheer numbers even just here in the UK the sheer numbers are like these sheds filled with chickens and filled with pigs like you never see pigs really out there on the ground they're all in sheds aren't they so. yeah absolutely like the recently a lorry crash with 10,000 chickens on it 10,000 I mean we can't imagine it can we the, no. the, like the suffering and uh, and also you're right about the bittersweet thing because mm. when we've got a calf at the sanctuary everyone is like oh isn't this wonderful but actually that calf's mother is still in the system somewhere yeah. that calf's grandmother will still be in the system somewhere you know yeah. it's terrible so and I guess you're you're like with sanctuaries you're really on the front line with the individuals here and so you're constantly faced with that and like how do you go psychologically with constantly being faced with this reality and these individuals you know coming out of this industry and then seeing let's just say the tv turns on and they're cooking steak on the barbecue barbecue or there's a chef on cooking the a piece of a chicken like how do you reconcile that being so closely connected to animals on a day-to-day -day basis is it harder for you or have you come to some sort of peace in your mind about it or oh no there's no peace there's no mm. peace i mean i don't think you could actually be a vegan and, and have peace how no. could you, how, how could you but uh, the first thing, don't watch telly. <laughs> you know, you, you don't watch anyway where you're going to see those Christmas ads because it's going to be, you know, all those terrible things. But actually the other side of that, social media, it's it's so individual to you that you get to see all the other horrors. You get to see all those, those ones who are alive awaiting that. So yep. actually what you have to do, part of our survival, the team survival, is you have to every day look at what you're doing here and actually think, actually, and the new people you meet that yeah. are kind of, people are waking up, you know, all the time. They're just, they're just embracing it. So, yeah, we just have to be, you know, base things on that. So, you, so you're just looking at it with the perspective of, okay, if you focus on the horrors too much, it might leave you hopeless. But when you focus on the change that's happening and the work that you're doing, it gives you a different perspective and a better feeling about things. You're, you're right. I mean, you, you can't change what's behind you. So mm. we've got to look forward, you know, mm. and, and actually um, I'm a great one. I know it's heavily criticized, but I'm a great one for baby steps. If people are telling me they're doing things rather than people sitting on their butts and doing nothing, yeah. I'd rather people be, you know, I love to hear people say, oh, I've changed my milk now. Yeah. I'm drinking plant milk. We had a visitor the other day that said it's absolute nonsense that the dairy industry is dying, milk drinking is dying, oh, wow. but actually cheese and um, the, the other products from milk are on the rise. Okay. But thankfully, plant milk is on the rise. So wow. we, we have to be grateful for that as well. So uh, Yeah, we have to live in reality too. If 
maybe that because because we have to know what to do as activists if we know milk uh, drinking is declining but you know cheese and chocolate and all these other products then we know what to target you're right <laughs> target the cheese yeah that, and that's actually why it's great listen to the almost like the enemy you yeah know, listen to them to tell you this is yeah. actually what's happening we're making big money out of mm. cheese now you know because actually milk is very cheap because people yeah. don't want to drink it yeah. so we're making big money out of cheese so yeah that's the next thing yeah. isn't it to- yeah and i i agree like if someone goes like if a family member of mine goes i've stopped drinking dairy i'm not going to go you're still exploiting all these other animals are your shoes leather I, i'm going to uh positively reinforce that that change and make them feel good about it because it is a good thing Uh, absolutely Mm. anything in the right direction Mm. anything where an animal is going to get some respite from Mm. you know i'm grateful for you know the times are so different now 30 years ago you'd be i spent a decade without a vegan friend you know so, so now you the pleasure of having um social media you have a um, a social media account you've got two and a half thousand mates haven't you you're all yeah. vegan it's incredible it's but a decade without a vegan mate so now I'm just like if I hear people going in the right direction I'm just so grateful you yeah know, so. that's amazing and what was it like for 10 years not having a vegan friend felt isolated well, or I must just say my sister did did it with me so I always had my sister oh, who is still by my side today still helps heavily in the at, at the sanctuary does everything so i always had her so amazing that was incredible but yeah it was still really difficult because of course there was vegans there was punks i wasn't a punk i was no. really square you know okay. really boring my sister looked like princess diana do you know what i mean <laughs> so we weren't punks we weren't hippies so that was the other thing so there was a few um vegans around but they were either punks or hippies and there wasn't no we couldn't find any square vegans do you know what i mean so yeah yeah. yeah, it wasn't it wasn't easy you know so we're very grateful now yeah there's many vegans and the the power of our social media and community you can connect with people all over the planet there's no reason to feel isolated or alone when there's so many of us now and supermarkets, what a place to meet vegans. You're, in, you're at the vegan cheese aisle and everyone says, oh, you're a vegan, you're buying that. And it's so brilliant and you you just connect, you know, it's it's fantastic. I so, love it. Supermarkets are my favourite to meet people yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we're so grateful for that as well. Um, so in the early days, were you, did you ever get in any trouble for helping animals? Because I know, like, obviously this is legally sanctioned what, what happens to animals. Have you ever found yourself in any trouble for helping animals? Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. So what we class as the other side of the law, mm. because obviously animal protesting back in, in the 80s and early 90s was a little bit more relaxed than it is now. I mean, um, but yeah, I was absolutely arrested for all sorts of things, sitting down on demonstrations, live exports, yeah, um, anti, I think one of, um, oh, what was it? It was the shark, um, the shark protest in Cornwall. I was arrested shark there. Shark fins well. or was it just uh, shark? No, just shark fishing. Okay. So yeah, there was like a big tournament every year and we went to stop that. And then there was some live export. Yeah, I was arrested many, many times. So, you know, yeah. you, you you end up in trouble and sitting in. I think actually I had, um, I was in Bow Street police station over the bank holiday and then they sent me on tuesday morning and although my mum and dad weren't happy you know i'm kind of like no i'm doing this for the animals so wow so so you felt that your actions were justified and you were on the right side yeah i think so and we look back actually now and we can see actually we had breakthroughs you know there was one thing after another where we stopped actually terrible things happening to animals there was the last cat farm for vivisection in britain which was called hill grove cat farm mm-hmm. and you know people power stopped that it just wonderful you know those things we we just stood up and were counted and yeah brilliant so in principle, do you think it's quite insane that those who are trying to do the right thing are being arrested and chucked in prison for it? Well, it's always happened, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, the, I think this year we saw the movie of the suffragettes and, um, you know, the suffragettes were really into criminal damage, yeah. which where they blew up um, post boxes and yeah. because they were like, you're going to listen to us, you mm. know. So it, it's, it's kind of something, direct action mm. where no one gets injured but actually people will listen to you and it, and it absolutely works and you know we should be thankful for it you know so so in terms of direct this is a topic that's heavily debated within the vegan activist community and the vegan community generally is whether these uh, forms of direct action where people are chaining themselves on to like slaughterhouses they're standing in front of trucks they might be spray painting things on walls to get 
you know, media attention, you know, what do you think about that? Do you think this is essential to social change? Oh, absolutely. Mm. I think every form of activism is important. And maybe people don't see the point of it at the time, but you can you can see it's like uh, the ripple effect. You know, mm. there, there may be only four or five people on a, on a chicken save standing on the side of the road. But how many people too, you know, yeah. how many people have started? How mm -hmm. many people will Google what they're doing mm -hmm. afterwards and then what comes from that so yeah it's all very positive i mean i'm for that definitely and also like lately we're seeing a big movement of people liberating animals with no masks on and posting it on social media and saying here's the victims um what do you think about that like there's real brazen like liberations and they don't feel like they're doing anything wrong so they're going to post about it well they're definitely not doing anything wrong are they i mean they are definitely the the brave people to to go and sit by the victims and not save them you know for those animals not to be saved this is quite courageous really i mean i could do that mm. I, I couldn't go to a save to be honest I couldn't go and watch those faces go in you know that would be soul destroying for me so I've got absolute admiration for those people who do it but isn't it amazing that these people now don't have to wear a balaclava they can go and sit there and say no this is me and this is what I'm doing and I don't care who sees it yeah. you know I actually saw one recently and my godson was at the front. Oh, I was so proud, you know. So wow. I, I, was just, I was just like, this is incredible. There he is. And that's just, for me, that's amazing. So, yeah. So you personally, um, being vegan 32 years, you would see that you would have seen changes in the movement. And like lately, let's just talk about the last five or six years. Like, how does that feel <coughs> to see the movement? Has it grown in your eyes? Has it grown exponentially? Has it gotten, is it about the same or? I'm not sure. It's so different. Mm. I mean, you know, it, Back in the 80s and early 90s, it was it was all about vivisection. Yeah. This is, you know, that was our target. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that had a long history, you know, probably what, in the early 80, and the early 1800s, there was, you know, people campaigning for the end of vivisection. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, um, British Union for the abolition of vivisection and those groups started around about the same time as the RSPCA, 1824, 1825, something like that. So, you know, we had a long history of anti-vivisection uh, in the UK. So, but you always hoped for this movement against the meat and milk trade and, mm. and now it's happening. So it's absolutely incredible. Yeah, I think it's amazing. Hats off. So do you see like it being getting bigger or do you see this what do you what do you feel what do you what are your foresights for the movement yeah well, there's an interesting thing and i suppose it's something that i ponder quite a lot um and i hear this a lot i hear people saying there's vegan activists and there's animal rights activists so i'm not sure if vegan activists are pushing the diet or um, an animal rights activists are pushing the whole thing but i mean this is all having benefits to animals yeah. isn't it the, the whole lot of it the more people that eat vegan, the less animals surely in the in the um, in factory farms. Mm. Absolutely, it's got mm. to be. You know, they they're not going to carry on breeding the same number of animals and filling these sheds. They're, they're just not doing. You know, it's because it's all down to economics, isn't it? The so consumer, yeah. we're ju we're just got to hope that this whatever people are doing impacts on the animals. So, yeah, yeah, I I am totally about that. Like when I first got into this, I was like, you have to say this, otherwise you don't truly care about but you know um now i've gotten to realize that we all have our place and you know we have the, the chefs and the plant-based advocates and the athletes and the animal <clears throat> rights activists and the fur activists and all of these different yeah. activists working together for you know the same goal we want to help animals uh, absolutely mm. and also i think you can look at what suits people and and i had a real lesson recently there's two new vegans came to the sanctuary and they were like, we're not doing enough. We want to be activists. Mm -hmm. But they actually, they were terribly shy. Okay. So the next time I saw them, say 12 weeks later, they came and said, oh, we're into, we've got into activism now. And I said, oh, what, what are you doing? And actually they're doing the, is it the Cuba Truth with yeah. the, the face mask? Yep. So these two shy people put the mask on. They become somebody else. Amazing. In incredible. Yeah. So, you know, this is... Um, for me, whatever you can do for animals, yeah. you know. And even if it means that, I know people will also say that being vegan is not enough, but for some people that might be all they can do, yeah. you know, and that's having an impact. So I'm I'm very grateful yeah. always. Yeah, I guess um, being in the movement for so long, you're just taking all the wins that you can get. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a royalist, but this week I put my thumbs up because <laughs> apparently someone said the old queen has given up 
um, having fur on whatever I mean yeah. not old fur I think she's still going to use some ceremonial costumes but actually it's in the right going in the right direction because there will be a lot of individuals that follow her that think this is all right wearing fur because her majesty wears it but now she don't wear it so you're going to get her followers who will go oh we're going to jump ship and do the same so I'm like yep that's good for me you yeah know. it's even good advertising even if you know let's just say in her personal life she probably she might not like but look but putting that message out to millions yeah. of people sends a message like oh queen's opposing fur wow uh, absolutely yeah. i mean i'm um, you know thumbs up for that and also it gets such coverage so you might read a story about the queen on the internet not wearing fur and then it leads you to some other animal rights article you know and that's yeah. we're grateful for that you know yeah for sure I, I'm all for the celebrities uh, even outwardly saying something that's pro-vegan or, you know, pro-animals. Um, and, you know, a lot of vegans, well, well, they're not technically vegan in real life, but, you know, I'm looking at it from a, a yeah. point of view of like, they've they got a huge following. They're putting that message out to millions of, you know how long it's going to take me to reach 100 million people? Yeah, absolutely. Forever. <laughs> yeah, Joey, and I think you're right there because what, what you have to remember is, yeah, you can be as vegan and as animal rights as you want or you can be, but that's you. And there's mm. another 7 billion people on this earth that's not going to all tick the same boxes yep. that you tick. Mm. So actually, however we get them there, we get them there. You know, yeah. it may not be the way that every great animal rights guru wants us to get them there, but if we get them there, we get them there. So yeah. I'm all for it. Like my story was like, uh, there was a raw foodist doing juicing and he wasn't, an animal rights vegan. He was just like, hey, have some juices and the, uh, the, the power of plant foods and the, the, the life-giving force of these juices. And, and he talked a little bit about karma and it just planted this seed. And I, and I use these juices to lose weight and it planted the seed of plants being healthy and karma from you know eating suffered animals. Now I'm a full-blown animal rights activist. Yeah, you know? see, look at that. The hmm. way you came into it. Hmm. you know, and I, and I think that's the way. I'm, I've met a few great... Um, vegan activists who come here who were happily eating animals and drinking milk but they were going on de um, dolphin demonstrations mm -hmm. someone gave him a vegan um, leaflet yeah that was it you know so that's their way in and now they're great people doing great work so yeah just be grateful that people have their eyes are opening at whatever speed at whatever rate just be grateful their eyes are opening yeah yeah i'm all for that too definitely we need to have a broader um view on the vegan movement and the animal rights movement and just you know i don't really like shooting down anyone's form of activism do you think there's anything that's really problematic as an activist to do or to say like what would you say that that's counterproductive yeah uh, i don't suppose counterproductive but one thing that i always find peculiar if if people are saying that they are vegans and they're actually not, they're still eating honey or eggs. Because I think now veganism has a definition yeah. like a any other word. Yeah. And you are not a vegan if you're eating eggs, wherever they come from. You know, yeah. if you're arguing that they come from your best mates who, who their two chicken have got a palace in the back, <laughs> you're not a vegan. If you're eating products with milk um, in them, even if it's the tiniest bit of whey, whatever, you're actually not a vegan, you know. Yeah. So, and I think this sends out the wrong message to people. It's yeah. like, oh yeah, I'm practically a vegan, but I still eat fish. No, you're not even a vegetarian <laughs> if you eat fish, you know. Yeah. So, I think terminology is very important. But yeah. apart from that, I'm like, let mm. people do as they will. Yeah, I get that too. Uh, you don't want people to, like an influencer, to be sending the wrong message of what a vegan is to uh, a Absolutely. lot of people. They could say, I've had this vegan meal or yeah. I've been moving towards more vegan products, but I'm not a practicing vegan because I'm still... <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a great guy who speaks on the TV. Um, I can't remember his surname. He's, he's been on Piers Morgan's show a couple of times. He's called George someone. Okay. He speaks about rewilding and stuff. He's incredible. He's really articulate and he mm -hmm. knows everything he's talking about. But he went on the Piers Morgan show wearing a leather watch strap. Now, yeah. that's bad news. Because yeah. if you're going to go on and represent um, any form of, you know, vegan angle, you're going to make sure that your shoes are not leather, your watch strap. So, yeah, and on Piers Morgan of all of all the shows. Yeah. To, you know. So if you go on to Piers Morgan's show, you've got to be ready for him because he's hell-bent on picking out flaws in vegans to so he can just write them off as hypocrites and you've really got to be on your toes with that because I feel like they target um, vegans to get on the show that, that can't hold their own against him. They have yeah. a history of that. Definitely. Yeah. 
Definitely. Um, what do you think about his uh, crusade against trying to make vegans into hypocrites? Do you think it's just a way of making himself feel better? Probably. But two things, really. I, I, do, I do think it's a good thing because I think that kind of exposure for the vegan movement, he makes himself look a fool every time. And so the vegan movement comes out winning each time, really, when it comes to him. Okay, may not always have the right vegan on the show. You know, sometimes they are... You can see they've got their backs against the corner, yeah. backs against the wall, and you think, right, actually, but I think where else would you get this a prime time television talking about yeah. veganism and the movement? And and so I kind of like that in a way. Yeah. And we know he's an idiot. We, he's, he's cruel. He's done some terrible things. Yeah. You know, the phone hacking of children who were yeah. murdered, their parents, as Stephen Lawrence. You know, we could go on and on and on about what he's done. He's, he's disgraceful, but yeah. for some reason, he's... He's got this morning show. He's doing us favors, I feel. When he when he got when they got me on the show, um, they wanted to discuss a few topics, but I feel like they had their ammunition on me, but like as they called me, uh, they must have known about my criminal history, and they must have always wanted to pull it out the bag. But I didn't know anything about Pierce Morgan. I didn't know anything about the show. I'm from Australia, and they wanted to get me on this Good Morning Britain. I'd heard he'd been, you know, speaking out against vegans or targeting uh -huh. veganism on his on his show. I didn't know anything about his history of phone hacking. And also what I didn't actually know about is that he wrote, wrote an article calling for the murder of uh, trophy hunters for poachers. Oh, yeah. And he's like, we should put Walter, what, the guy that killed the rhinoceros, was oh, it? Oh, yeah, Walter, uh, the dentist. The dentist. Yeah. He wanted to put the guy's decapitated head up in his office, you know. But he criticised, he criticised me for saying once when I was the most angry I've ever been that I, I titled a video that ethical hunters deserve a bullet in the head, right? Obviously, I don't put that stuff out there anymore. They found it. The media found it in some of my old posts. They made an article about it. But what a hypocrite. He made... I never called for the hunters, the, the murder of hunters. I just said they deserve karma. Yeah. Right? He actually directly called for the murder of a hunter. And he called me out for, for this thing that I said about hunters when he'd done exactly the same thing. Yeah, apparently it's called froth, isn't it? That's what they call it on these shows. It could froth, but I mean, people know what he's about. Yeah. But as long as we're talking about veganism, you know, it's kind of there was the thing where a Waitrose editor called for all vegans to be murdered. Yeah. Do you remember that? No, it did. Piers Morgan have him on the show and say this is a bit terrible because there are children who are vegans. Yeah. They're going to school this morning. They may be struggling a bit with that. You know, yeah. Never called. So we know he's angry. We we know he's a despicable human being. Mm. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, you know, and those people that have suffered most have suffered at the hands of him. So mm. we're, we're not bothered. We're now, strong. And also, like, if he's against veganism and he's such a polarizing figure, he's got so many haters out there, then they might be thinking, wow, Pierce Morgan's against it. Maybe I'll give it a try. <laughs> let's hope so. Yeah, let's absolutely hope so, because he has done appalling things, appalling I, I, th I do think that he helped the uh, sausage roll go viral with Greg's. Uh, yeah. And, you know, so it all, it all, it all, like, you know, we talk about counterproductive things in the movement. I honestly don't know about, you know, whether all publicity, I, mean, I don't know whether bad public publicity is necessarily bad for the movement. I think it gets it into the public debate, you know, because so there's bad publicity about vegans, then it gives us a chance to step up and debate about it. And, you know, we always You're win the debate. You're absolutely right. Yeah. There's been the thing recently with plant milk. People are saying, oh, plant milks are not all cracked up to what they're meant to be. And we're like, no, they're meant to be pretty much filtered water yeah. with 1% of whatever is in. Unlike dairy milk, that's been cracked up you know, that's not what it has been cracked up for all these generations. So it gives you time to discuss this with people, mm. which is brilliant, you know? Yeah. I, I think if we force it into the debate, um, we are, we've got the most logical position here. You know, we're the most consistent. You know, yeah. you, you, we're not... You, veganism isn't perfect, you know? You, you know, there's still impact. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, just by living, we're going to cause environmental impact. Yeah. Animals are going to be displaced by civilization. We have to come to terms with that. But I feel like vegans are the most consistent, you know. Without a doubt. Yeah. And, and actually, they're doing something. Yeah. You know, this, the, the planet's in a mess. Yeah. So, and they're actually doing something. So yeah. all of those who are just like, oh, case okay, case okay, sera, you know, the, the vegans are doing something. They're yeah. not going to sit back, you know. Exactly. And, and, and you, you're striving to, to, to the best you can. And if that means like eliminating animal products from your diet and, you know, you're making sure you're not wearing, you know, the skins of animals. And yeah. these are very practical, easy things to, to implica in, in, you know, to introduce into your lifestyle that aren't going to, you know, displace your, you know, well-being. 
yeah but, you know so i uh, i've got a watch which is a vegan watch mm-hmm. and um s- someone said recently ah you, that plastic strap well what about the toxin what and i said actually it's clever it's plant leather it's, mm. n- it's not even plastic and mm. they're like what you get the chance to talk about about things that are new you know and they're like what do you mean? And we're like, well, we're making leather out of mushrooms now. The the runoff of the grapes from wine industry, we're making, uh, you know, pineapple. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just fantastic, you know. It's just incredible. Yeah. So, Yeah, anything that gets the discussion out there, I think. Um, and it's fantastic that we have, you know, the power of social media and platforms like this podcast here where everyone can listen to this. Hope they're listening to it while they're getting some exercise or cooking some vegan food. So where to from here? I'm... Um, you know, you've already, you've come on a long journey. Um, you know, you've come so far. You've been doing this for as long as I've been alive. What do you, what do you forecast for the next few years? Okay, so ideally, I'd, I'd like the retreat to be known as a discovery center. Yeah. This is... Um, you know, for me, it's it's education. We can't save every animal in the world. So yeah. we've got to get that education out. So I'd really like the place to be developed into a discovery center so schools could come, learn about the environmental impact of farming to start to make their changes. Um, even the local school, which is a Christian school, um, is now doing a meat free Monday. Wow. So they come and visit here. So we know that that's had an impact, which is absolutely brilliant. So discovery center all the way, obviously to continue, um, continue to buy, um, more and more land to accommodate more and more animals. Mm. Because as we know, we've touched on earlier, the more vegans, the more, um, saved farm animals they're going to be, you know, so whereas 30 years ago when I was doing this, it was predominantly horses, cats and dogs that came because it was very little vegans. Now, most of the phone calls are turkeys and piggies uh, and, you know, sheep and Mm. all the food animals. So bigger the better, but also to develop the fact that it's going to be a discovery center. Yeah, because um, it's all well and good to rescue individual animals and that means the world to that individual animal. But if you attach advocacy onto that, like... These are these are why animals are important. These are the, why they're intelligent. They're suffering. They're feeling pain. This is an animal that was rescued from that injury. Attaching education and advocacy onto those rescues just has a knock-on effect, doesn't it? Amazing. Yeah, a- absolutely. I always say when I walk people around and I tell people the story of an individual animal, I call it a survivor story. Yeah. I say this animal represents billions of others, you know, which we can't help. Sadly, we can't help. But each person takes that story home with them. So the mm. next time they're in the supermarket or they're shopping online, they think about that survivor story yeah. and they think, oh, actually, look, it's a nice non-leather handbag, nice non-leather mm. pair of shoes because I remember that cow, yeah. you know. So that, for me, that's really important do you think the power of an individual animal's story surviving is bears more weight than the whole like let's just say millions of animal millions of cows just like that individual animal was saved do you think that you know has more emotional weight to people yeah because i think it's back to that in that kind of that fundamental that all suffering is individual Mm -hmm. so it tells a story when you see the masses so if you see the the starving on a tv show Mm. in, in some terrible place that is foreign to us and you know we can't understand why there's no crops and there's no water but you tell the individual story of a, of a child or a family member yeah. and all of a sudden it brings it home you know we're all individuals and i think that's what it does with animals you know you tell the individual story of that turkey that got out of that shed of thirty thousand, and what would have happened and uh, wow. people are like this is you know this is incredible so yeah absolutely Amazing. So let's just tell a story now. What, tell us one of the survival stories from your farm, uh, from your sanctuary here. Not a farm. <laughs> this isn't a farm. <laughs> yeah. So there was a little duck. Uh, and sorry, another little duck. Um, this is another little duck yeah. story. And um, he was called Andrew, mm. and he was reared for for meat by a um, so a supermarket basically standard duck so he was reared and um, in those big as you know in those big massive units there are thousands and then they have automatic things that pick them all up and then there are some that are just stuck in the muck because they're too disabled and Andrew was what was commonly known as a scoop duck so when the mechanical stuff went in to get rid of the waste there was live ducks but they were disabled stuck and he was nothing. He was muck. He was going to be composted alive. And um, he came to the centre and actually we had him for four years. And he was the most incredible little thing. So he was terribly disabled. Um, 
but he could swim every day. When, when his weight was put in the water, he could still swim. His walking wasn't great, so he'd have to have a little chair and stuff, but he could swim when he was put in water, so he had to be supervised every day. So, yeah, Andrew, for me, symbolises, you know, across the board, everything that, you know, what a special, special little being he was and we would never forget him so never ever ever so wow, yeah how beautiful so andrew was nearly scooped up and you know died in their in yeah. the waste and he got a second chance yeah so like people in the industry called them scoop ducks because mm. they were scooped out with a muck that oh was it God. composted alive i mean you can't, you can't believe this is a country where we pride ourselves in animal welfare laws and this is commonplace we actually have terms for calves born in slaughterhouses bobby calves you know this is just unbelievable we had t we have terms for these poor creatures you know it's all whoa you know it's unbelievable isn't it have you ever had any pregnant animals come in that you didn't know were pregnant yeah so we had a cow she's still here now fiona yeah so she was rescued at 14 mm -hmm. she went to the market she was uh just basically but skin and bone. So mm -hmm. she came in and we kind of felt we'd probably have her for six months. You know, we looked at her condition. Anyway, we feed her and we love her and she grows beautiful and blossoms each day. And we thought that was the buckets of food we were giving her. And we had no idea that she wasn't far off giving birth. So two months into us having her, we came out one morning and boom, there was Myrna, a little brown calf. So Fiona would have gone to slaughter um what two months off of uh giving birth so possibly in that slaughterhouse in a fit of frenzy she would have given birth to to that baby in that slaughterhouse or if not murdered with a with a viable baby inside so they both live here their bond is incredible you know we look at them every day and think you know they symbolize um in britain alone 150,000 term mothers go to slaughter mm. every year. They're lined up in that line and their babies are kicking, ready to come out and they're in that line to be murdered, you know, just because their milk yields are dropped or they've mm. they got mastitis again or they're a little bit lame. You know, mm. those animals were de deliberately impregnated. They were, so this is, not like a, this is not like a myth. These animals were impregnated and those farmers know that they are pregnant and still 150,000, that's death numbers. That's not, you know, vegans numbers, that's death numbers. number. 150,000 a year go to slaughter, term pregnant. How Unbelievable. horrible. And they've lost probably four or five calves to pregnancies, you know, to the farmers, you know, yeah. before that. Um, and what do they do with these calves? Have you heard of the fetal calf serum? Is that what they, they, they take the, the, the blood out of these calves to use um, as serum? Oh, boy. Yeah. So I think they use a lot of the, 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 the calf serum in experiments and it's horrible. Like Frankenstein stuff, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Disgusting. Um, so... Who would believe this? I mean, if you was to stop the people on the street, who would believe this? It's like yeah. we're, our eyes are closed, aren't we? We're just like we're just kept in the dark about this stuff. I mean, put humans in the animal's position, we'd be like saying this is an atrocity. This is an atrocity. But it's almost like these things are brushed over because they're animals, because it's the way we view animals. Like we're just like, oh, they're just animals, so it doesn't really matter that much. It's pretty yeah. bad. But like, I yeah, think they're not cats and dogs. No, they're not cats and dogs, and they're not humans, and they're not yeah. human children. But like. I think, like, for me, making that connection even stronger would, would be, like, when I was still, like, not connected to animals was be, would be, like, to put a human in their position, to put a dog in their position, and then reevaluate that with, with the different species in there and go, wow, this is a lot more horrific without my conditioning that these animals yeah. are just food. Mm. Have you seen the, the, I only saw it this week on social media, the, the milking of the nuts. It's like a, it's like a, uh, what do you call it? like a spoof advert and okay. they're, they're milking the almonds. Mm. And it's, it's incredible because it's this lunacy that people believe about the cows and the calves yeah. and they're playing it out with the almonds. And you yeah. think, oh, this is so incredibly stupid. Yeah. And of course it actually is. You've listened to this rubbish about what the farmers tell you about the, the cows and the calves and how they love them. And, oh, this is terribly sad. And uh, if something's terribly sad, you stop doing it, don't yeah. you? You know, you, 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 you just there's alternatives there these are the people who are sitting on the assets they're sitting on the land yeah they can change tomorrow you yeah. know yeah so yeah let them do it yeah uh do you feel that if if it really if they really felt that it was that bad they would just immediately stop exploiting and impregnating and making money off of these animals every time they like the first time they took them to the slaughterhouse or sent them off to be killed 
you know, that, that would be the time where they go, wow, there's something inherently wrong about this. I've got to stop. <laughs> Without a doubt. Yeah. If, you, if you felt anything was wrong, you'd stop it now. Mm. You wouldn't be saying, I'm going to send a percentage of them off and, get, you know, whatever, and do this on a smaller scale or I'm going to try and give them more room or I'm not yeah. going to milk them as much. You would stop doing it now if you really believed it. But sadly, it's all down to the, uh, the old dollar, isn't it? You yeah, know, the old pound money. note. That's it. And uh, there's... There's so much they can do. They're sitting on the assets. They're sitting on the farms. They can change. People yeah. do all the time, you know. Yeah. Dairy farmers change to beef farmers. Beef farmers change to sheep farmers. Well, they can just start growing things, can't they? Yeah. Industries the change. Like yeah. I was thinking about the mining industry. Fiona was telling me that her father could become redundant because the mining industry went down. And, yeah. you know, industries go down all the time. Things change all the time. And, and if you're a lucrative, you know, savvy business person, you can find other ways to make money, you know. And yeah, absolutely. And they're sitting on the assets. You look at the machinery they use, which costs hundreds of thousands of pounds, not mm. tens of thousands of pounds, hundreds of thousands of pounds. Mm. They have the money. They have the assets. You've got the land. They can do it. It's like, get on with it, mm. you know. Uh, what I feel like is a really crazy psychology that I, I'm trying to understand is that they can feel that it's wrong in, in their heart, but everyone's telling them this is normal and they're brought up and there's other farmers and they're saying, no, no, this is fine. This is just the way it is. And so maybe that's that's going against what their heart is telling them. You know, maybe as a child, their, their father was a dairy farmer and they first saw this happening. And so it's like really conditioned into their psychology for them to go against what they know is wrong. There'd have to be some heavy things going on in their mind. Oh, I'm not going to cut them that kind of credit. Um, I, I, they know it's wrong. It's all, it's all economics. Okay. You know, they're, they're, it, it buys them the new car. It buys them the, the place they want to live, the holiday. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, we can, you know, there are things that, that all of us have done which yeah. weren't right, no. you know, and we all go, this is not right. Yeah. Today is the day of change. You know, mm. you can't. And it didn't involve hundreds of thousands of animals, them looking in our eyes and thinking, oh boy, you know, maybe this is wrong. Maybe this is wrong. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, occasionally I do a, I have a deer in and I do a deer release mm. and I've nurtured that deer and I've loved it and I've brought it back and uh, I take it off to where it has to go and I let it go and I let it out the box and the carrier and off the deer goes into the wood. And just as it's about to disappear, it kind of looks back. It looks back at me and, and it, destroys my soul because i think my god there's all this out there you know it's 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 life's in its own little pause now that's mm. that's something but imagine those farmers every time they take their beloved animals that have lived with them for seven or eight years to slaughter what don't any of them ever look back and think those cows look back and think what are you doing to me man what are you doing to me where am i going i can hear all that in there they must you know so those farmers are cold i'm not going to yeah. cut them any credit i'm afraid I definitely understand that, but I, I, because I'm me, I'm trying to put myself in their perspective. But you, it makes total sense if if the animals are looking at you and they they know animals better than most people, better than most like. And I think when vegan activists make you know bring these things up, we're saying something that's very true. And the farmers want to keep a secret because they don't want people to know that that this is an inherently cruel and, you know, they, they don't want us talking about the slaughterhouse. They want us talking yeah. about the green pasture that they have and the room the animals have and what good nick their dairy cows are in, what good condition these dairy cows are in. They don't want us talking about the slaughterhouse. So something in their heart knows it's wrong and we, we represent that voice of truth that they're trying to keep stifled and try to keep silent. So, yeah, I totally understand that. And when you, when you think about all the animals that you've had to, you know, because you're on the front lines, just you, you experience day to day what animals are like you know their personalities farmers do too so yeah. they know very well that these animals don't want to die yeah mm. without a doubt i mean from from the age of 10 to about 19 i was always in um livery yards with mm. my sister had a pony and that's how i've got my first rescued horses because they were going to be put to sleep and i would watch horse after horse be shot because uh, people couldn't sit on their backs anymore they couldn't ride them so i'd wait i I knew this was this was normal to me. These horses were being shot. I knew it was wrong. And as soon as I had my horses, and only 5% of people were killing their horses by injection at this time, whereas 95% of people were shooting their horses, I still said, boy, I wouldn't shoot the dog. You know, mm. I wouldn't shoot the duck or the cat. I'm not going to shoot the horse. So when only 5% of the population was put into sleep by injection, we put our horses to sleep by injection. It would have been so easy to have run with the rest, but we knew it was wrong, so we weren't going to do it. You yeah. know, and to this day, we don't shoot any of our animals. They're all put to sleep by injection. So you, you can argue all you want that people have had all of these um, 
indoctrinations but actually you people know what's right and wrong and to see those individual animals that you know when they see the farmer going up the field the, those cows bellow out to them because it, for whatever reason mm. you know and they must have a relationship but they're just um, unfortunately mm. they're just hard they're mm. just cold mm. you know well yeah definitely and um i just hope more of them start to act you know responsibly with these animals and start letting you know i think the more the more that this becomes socially unacceptable and we start calling out this unethical behavior uh they won't be able to do this anymore they will be yeah. ashamed of doing it and i think that's where we've got to reach a point where people become ashamed to treat animals like this because hey they've got voices now you Act. know you can't abuse these animals anymore because you're gonna have to deal with us yeah absolutely mm. and that's happening isn't it that's yeah. happening all the time not just on an animal point of view but i mean people talk about the health you know mm. of, of eating animal products and what it's doing to people yeah. we know about the environment the environment is uh, you know it's in the media every day mm. every time you turn on there's something mm. else about the media and it's all linked to agriculture you yeah. know it's kind of like there's some silly post put up the other day about um agriculture has been like this for 10,000 years and has not had any um, impact on the environment. Yeah. It's like 10,000 years ago, there was not 7 billion people on this <laughs> earth. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like you've now got, you know, however many people eating that diet. We know it's going to impact. What are you talking about? Yeah. It's like they're fools, absolute fools. So it's happening every day. And, yeah. and I'm so grateful I'm alive to watch it. You yeah. know, it's kind of like amazing. It's growing, it's growing. So from here on out i mean we've been talking about the ethical implications of animal products and the animals that are rescued and there might be some people at home or some even some vegans at home wondering how they can help out like what you know some people can't do what i do get out there in the street some people can't have a sanctuary is there any way that you know people at home might be able to help you with some of your ventures here yeah absolutely so um, first of all you can look at our social media or our website we've got a wonderful new website and um, basically you can come and stay in our lodges because yeah. we've got holiday lodges that people can come and stay in and you can help out uh, we've got a vegan cafe which is open most of the year closed the first of december reopens end of march uh, we've got a wish list you can we've got a crowdfunder at the moment to yeah. buy the farm next door you can donate to that and if you can't donate you can share that page yeah. you know share it with your friends you never know uh, the other day someone picked up a flyer in a vegan cafe wow. and donated a thousand pounds wow so you never know where you're going to share where you're going to leave the leaflets so this is in, this is incredible this is the power of just doing something you yeah. know um and uh, secondly, you can sponsor animals, you can adopt animals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's huge amounts you can do. So yeah, and just come and visit and meet the animals. No charge. Um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, 12 to 4, we're open. So, Amazing. Yeah. And they can bring family members that aren't yet vegan to connect with the animals. Absolutely. And that's what we want, you know, because we hear people say, once you meet them, you can't eat them. And that's a great, it's a great saying because who in their right mind is going to come and see these really kind, gentle animals and then go home and just what fry off a pork chop and mm. eat it really very unlikely um it w might happen but it's very it's a lot less likely to happen once you've met the victims of you know the food choices we make yeah absolutely and i think you know once you come to a place a lot of people come here because they are not vegan so we have about 70 percent of visitors who come who are not vegan because it's almost like they think it's like a free day out yeah but it's the start of their we open their eyes so yeah. they take a leaflet they go and they google something yeah. they change they've enjoyed the food you know they've met the animals so it's a start you know so we're very grateful for and that. there's signs everywhere with little quotes and phrases on there that get people thinking and the food is absolutely amazing Thank you. Yeah. so it's all linked it's like here are the victims here are the alternative foods here are some phrases to get you thinking here's what you can do to help yeah and also they get to me a lot of really lovely people yeah. on top of it who are already vegan, yeah. who are not dying of protein deficiency. <laughs> you know, these these are really great people that are just doing, you know, ultra runners and marathon runners. These people who are fit, yeah. people, you know, this is, you know, this is... Kind it's for of everyone. Cool. It's yeah. for everyone. Different athletic, athletic uh, abilities, different, you know, political stance, different, uh, you know, any, anyone is yeah. welcome to be against... You know, Absolutely. animal abuse. I mean, it's you don't have to be a particular type of person, a hippie or this or that. Or, You're right. You know. A Absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're not bothered who comes through that gate yeah. because, you know, whoever comes through that gate is better than who drives past it. So exactly. you get them in and you can open their eyes. You know, it'd be the start for them. So, yeah. you know, just today we've got 
some people in the cafe they only come a year ago and now there's three generations in their family that are vegan so you know boom done like that they met the animals and that's it so it's great Thank you so much, Billy. Thank, Thank you, you so Joey. much to you and your team. Um, I'm a very fresh in the movement comparative to you. You've been in the movement for a very, very long time. I want to just give you a very big nod of respect for all the struggles you've been through, all the dedication. Thank and you. it's not an easy job. This is, I would say, from perspective, this is one of the hardest jobs you can do, caring after all these animals. And it's like you've got a bunch of children here that you're looking after constantly. And um, I just want to say on behalf of all the animals over the years and on behalf of the movement, thank you so much for all of your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks Joey. so much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I don't Thanks know why the heating didn't work. Thank that you, so good. Thank you, mate.